In this video, we're going to talk about waves. The first thing we want to be able to do is define what exactly is a wave. And we can define it as a disturbance that transfers energy through matter or space. So essentially, a wave is simply moving energy. Now, when you think of a wave, you're usually thinking about oscillations, things oscillating up and down. And these oscillations can be of a physical medium, such as an ocean wave. As the water goes up and down, there's an actual physical medium, the water moving. That type of wave is considered a mechanical wave. Waves can also be oscillating fields, such as electromagnetic fields, where you have an electric field and a magnetic field oscillating up and down. Now, for waves on the MCAT, you need to be able to classify waves as transverse waves or longitudinal waves. The main difference between these waves is the direction of their oscillations relative to their direction of wave propagation. So for transverse waves, their oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. And you can see how that works at this diagram. You can see as the wave is traveling from left to right in the horizontal direction, the oscillations are going up and down. They're perpendicular to each other. Another example of a transverse wave, and one that you definitely want to know from AMCAT, is light. So light is an electromagnetic wave, and as I referenced to earlier, and as you can see in this diagram, there are electric fields and magnetic fields that are oscillating in a direction perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Okay, the other type of wave is longitudinal. So longitudinal waves have oscillations that are parallel to the direction of wave propagation. Now, this is a little bit harder to understand how it works, so the best way to understand this is by taking a look at this diagram. So you can see in this diagram, as the wave again is traveling in a horizontal direction, you can see how the particles are essentially oscillating such that there are parts where the particles compress and you have a high density of particles and parts where there's rarefaction going on, where you have a low density of particles. And as you oscillate with the density of particles going from high to low, high to low, that's an oscillation in itself. And you can see this oscillation going from high to low, high to low density of particles is in the same direction of wave propagation. So that's a longitudinal wave. A very good example of a longitudinal wave is sound, where essentially what you're hearing is pressure waves of air particles hitting your ear. Okay, so now that we know the basics of waves, I want to talk about the different types of wave properties. And you get a lot of questions on the exam about these specific wave properties and how they're related to each other. So as you can see here, I've drawn a sample wave. So here, this is a transverse wave. The wave is traveling from left to right and oscillating up and down. So several terms we want to define. First of all, propagation speed. This is simply the distance traveled by the wave per unit time. So essentially, this is just looking at how fast is our wave moving, right? Essentially, this is the speed of our wave. For light, this would be three times 10 to the eight, meters per second, a very large propagation speed. Our next term here is amplitude. Amplitude is the maximum displacement from zero. So zero is our x-axis, so the amplitude would be referring to this value right here, the greatest displacement from zero. And of course, we oscillate between positive A and negative A, the maximum displacement from amplitude. Now, one thing important to know for waves is that the amplitude is very important in determining the energy of a wave. That the energy of a wave is actually directly proportional to the amplitude of the wave squared. So essentially, the greater the amplitude, the greater the energy of that wave. Cycle, this is the interval required to return to the same point in a wave in terms of position and motion. So a wave completes one cycle when it starts from one point in terms of position and motion and returns to the same point in position and motion. For instance, if I look at this point right here at the origin, right now the displacement is zero. So its position is right at zero. And its direction, it's moving up right, towards positive displacement. As I follow along this wave, I need to find another point where I have the same position and motion. 
So as I go up the wave, I come down the wave, I reach this point over here where the position is also zero. However, this is not considered a cycle because instead of moving up, right, in the original situation, my uh, position and motion is actually, the motion wants to move down. So the position is the same, but the motion isn't. So this is not considered one cycle. So I have to keep following the wave until I reach this position right here. At this position, my position is zero, and my motion is also up towards positive displacement. So this would be considered a full cycle from this point right here to this point right here. That is one full cycle. So again, from one point in position and motion to another point of the same position and motion. Be able to define a cycle is important because we use it to define several other terms. But another thing I want to mention is you don't have to always define the cycle using points like I used here. Simpler definitions would just be using the crust. So from one crust to another crust, that is a cycle. From one trough to another trough, that is also a cycle. So you can define a cycle starting from any arbitrary point going back to the same arbitrary point. All right, so now knowing what a cycle is, we can talk about the wavelength. The wavelength is the distance traveled in one cycle. So essentially, we can look at this graph and we can say that whatever distance was traveled from this position along the wave to this position along the wave, that is the wavelength. Then we have the period. The period is the amount of time that it takes to complete one cycle. So from one point back to the same point in this cycle, the wavelength is the distance that was traveled in that cycle. The period is the amount of time it took the wave to travel that distance in one cycle. So in terms of the period, the units would be the amount of time it takes to complete one cycle. So you would think of the units as seconds per cycle. But generally, when we're reporting the units for the period, we usually just ignore the cycles. So that means the units is just going to be seconds. So if something has a period of five seconds, that means it takes it five seconds to complete one cycle. Okay. So now we can talk about frequency. Frequency is denoted by lowercase f. This is the number of cycles completed per second. As you think about it, this is actually very much related to period, right? Period is how long it takes to complete one cycle. Frequency is the number of cycles you complete per second. So for instance, if your period was 0.2 seconds. It takes you 0.2 seconds to complete one cycle. That means you can complete five cycles in one second. So your frequency would be five cycles per second. But again, similarly, in terms of the units, we tend to ignore the cycles part. So the units for the frequency are simply one over seconds, or another unit that is often used is hertz. So if something has a frequency of 10 hertz, that means it completes 10 cycles per second. And since I just described how period and frequency are related, there's actually an equation that you can use to relate the two each other, the two to each other, which is period and frequency are inversely related. If you have the period, just invert it, that gives you the frequency, and vice versa with the frequency. Okay. So the last wave property for us to discuss is phase. Phase refers to the initial position of a wave along its wave cycle. Now, this is a little hard to understand by itself, so it's easier to actually consider what is called the phase difference, which is also what the MCAT cares more about. So the phase difference is you're looking at two waves and seeing how they align up. If the two waves perfectly line up, then we say that the waves are in phase. So when you look at these two waves, you can see where you have a crust in one wave, you have a crust in the second wave. Where you have a trough in one wave, you have a trough in the other wave, right? They perfectly line up. So these two waves are in phase, and when waves that are in phase run into each other, the interference is constructive, and you end up with a wave 
with a greater amplitude than either of the original waves. Essentially, you add up the amplitude. So here, the first wave had an amplitude A1, the second wave had an amplitude A2. The resulting wave is going to have an amplitude that's equal to the sum of the two original amplitudes. And again, as I said earlier, if you have waves that are in phase, they experience what we call constructive interference. And this happens because when you add up the waves, you essentially just add up their displacements. So here, because everything lines up, where you have positive displacement in the first wave, you also have positive displacement in the other wave. So when you add them together, you get an even larger positive value. Same thing with the negative displacements. Where you have negative displacement in the first wave, you have negative displacement in the second wave. Again, when you add up those negative displacement values, you end up with an even larger negative value. So giving you a larger amplitudes. Okay, so this is in phase if your waves perfectly line up. Here we're gonna talk about out of phase by 180 degrees. Now, earlier when we were talking about a cycle, it's the amount of time it takes to go from one point to another point. And one cycle can also be discussed in terms of degrees. One full cycle is essentially a full circle, 360 degrees. So here, if we're out of phase by 180 degrees, that means we're half a cycle off. So what that means is where you have a crest in one wave, you have a trough. Where you have a trough in the first wave, you have a crest in the second. So they're perfectly opposites of each other. And you can see how you can get, go from in phase to out of phase if you just take this wave and you shift it by half a cycle, all right? So 180 degrees out of phase is essentially half a cycle out of phase. When you're 180 degrees out of phase, when you add up the two waves by interference, where you have positive displacement in one wave, you have negative displacement in the other. So the resulting wave that you get actually has a smaller amplitude than the two waves. You have to take the difference in amplitudes between the two waves, which in this case, A1 is greater than A2, so the amplitude would be equal to A1 minus A2. And here, since the amplitudes are canceling out, this is what we call destructive interference. Okay, so a couple other points. If 180 degrees is half of a cycle, if you are 360 degrees out of phase, that means you're a whole cycle behind. But if you're a whole cycle behind, then you're still going to align with the first wave. So in phase is the same as out of phase by 360 degrees or 720 degrees or any multiple of 360. And these are the two instances that are most tested on the MCAT, in phase versus out of phase by 180 degrees. But you should recognize you don't have to just either be aligned or be half a cycle on a line. You can also be a quarter cycle off. So that would be 90 degrees out of phase. And you can see how that works in this diagram here. Here we have two waves. They're 90 degrees out of phase, which means they're one quarter of a cycle on a line. Now, the reason why we don't talk about 90 degrees out of phase as much is because with in phase, only constructive interference occurs. With out of phase by 180 degrees, only destructive interference occurs. When you look at this diagram of 90 degrees out of phase, there are some parts of the wave where constructive interference occurs and others where destructive interference occurs. So the physics makes sense, but it's just a little bit more complicated than these two situations. Okay, so that's what you need to know about waves for the MCAT. In subsequent videos, we're going to look in more detail at both light and sound.